really pleased to be here today. We'll just introduce ourselves a little bit and then I'll say something that I um, hope will build on the things that we've heard so far. So um, as you've just heard, um, I'm an associate professor here at Northumbria University in the Department of Social Work, Education and Community Wellbeing. Um, I'm really passionate about teaching and learning and engagement, meaningful engagement. So that's me. Uh, I'm Millie, I'm third year childhood and early year study student. Um, my interests are particularly childhood behaviours, including play and development, and um, the idea of how this can be supported through STEM, wanting to become a special educational needs teacher mm -hmm. when I finished. And I'm Grace Fletcher, um, I'm also a third year student at Northumbria University um, doing childhood and early year studies. Um, and I'm quite interested in special, educa special educational needs and child development. Thank you both for joining me on this, because I know one of the things, if we just look at the next slide, that we've been working on together is, <laughs> I'll explain the image in a moment, um, is just this idea of engagement. And, and one of the things to say right at the start, I guess, is that all of us have been through that process of lockdown yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, learning online. So, you know, feel free to share your experiences of that. We thought we'd start off in this presentation initially by talking about some of the the challenges that we face in, in teaching and learning. And then as we move through the presentation, we're gonna talk more about what engagement means and, and to share some of the imperfect experiments, I guess, we've done together to um, address the sort of interactions that we have online, to think about how do we best use that time, whether we're synchronous or asynchronous and how, especially for me, I guess, how we translate some of the physical tools that you can see here into digital environments so that interaction becomes, uh, we take it to the next level. So, yeah, we've got this, I'm just showing this like It's a particular room here at the university where um, <clears throat> some of our health colleagues will store simulation models. And if you uh, forget they're in there and walk past that, that room, you can get a bit, a bit of a shock. But our, our aim is, is to sort of have the opposite reaction to the one we see here on the screen, which is to actually be awake, be alive. And it's not always like that, is it? Um, I mean, do you want to share one or two things about what's been hard about, you know, the, the downside of of teaching and learning for you, like when it's hard? I'd probably say the hard, well, first year for both me and Grace was completely online and interaction to a computer screen is completely different to interaction in the classroom, um, whether that's interaction in the classroom with five students or interaction in the classroom with 50 students, it doesn't matter, you've still got that. It's the whole idea of body language and I'm not sure about other right. universities, but that was quite hard to image when you were online. Uh, but it was also the idea of, are we going to turn cameras on? We're going to turn cameras off. Is it all going to work? Technical issues. Like what are the rules in this environment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then the only interaction you were getting was through a screen. So it was all PowerPoints rather than the physical stuff, I'd say, maybe. Yeah. There was like very limited interaction as well online. Um, because you've got like if there's not loads of resources online, it can't do the activities um, that you would do in a lecture theatre. Um so it's more seeing on a screen rather than doing um because you can't that's a great way of saying it yeah yeah i'd maybe say as well like the whole interaction side of it was very self-led mm -hmm. yeah so yes you'd get an email from your lecturer 
once a day or once a week or whatever it was but the idea of actually completing a task you're not going to see this lecture mm. so it's the whole you have to some people will some people won't yeah. and in some courses i guess can't generalize but there are some responses to teaching completely online or, or moving aspects of courses online where um, sometimes we're reverted to things we wouldn't normally do in the classroom, just reading through slides, for example. And I know that we've had conversations about how unhelpful that can be, not building any, any sort of those uh, activities. And like you say, um, Millie, it's, it, it's a thing of there only being one way to contribute. And that's yeah. fine if you're confident. I know you're quite a good contributor. <laughs> you both are. I can but if speak. if it's it's either that or nothing, it's quite hard, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's the motivation as well that's a major part of it. Like I said before, like you get set a task that you're not actually gonna see this lecturer, they're not gonna chase you up for it. Mm. So some people would just say, oh well. It's building on some of those thoughts about accountability and that yeah, and yeah so, so that that's really really useful if we could go to the next slide that would be great i know that we all want to continue just looking at um uh, the, the the models but but no and actually you two are probably hiding in the background of, of this mm -hmm. image do you think yeah <clears throat> so i suppose prompted a little bit by this shift to more diversified teaching and learning spaces, we've tried to take an approach where we work together and we, we, we think reflectively together about it, because that's very much our approach here uh, at Northumbria, that we will be curious together. So rather than giving instructions, we're sort of posing questions and we're saying, what are the issues and how can we respond to it? So a big issue has been about, as you both said, how do you participate meaningfully and how do you interact online? It's like we, want, we definitely wanted to work to go together on that, haven't we? I guess just one other thing as well with um, the online status is from a student's perspective, it's okay, well, if you'll do it first, because whether it's <laughs> online reading or the lecturer asks you a question and puts a poll up, for example, it's, oh well, I'm not going to be the first, who is going to be mm. the first type yeah. situation. But as soon as that first person is gone, they just keep looking in. So it's the confidence. So it's almost like sometimes it's, it sounds like what we're, part of what we're saying is sometimes it's the really small things that we pay attention to that matter. So we might not even give much thought to, or, you know, tutors may not give it much thought in planning a session, but little things like that matter a lot. Like, am I allowed to be the first or how does this work? It takes a lot of confidence, doesn't it? Just to go, oh, I'm just going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose we have been asking questions about what does it mean to be a learning community when you have synchronous and asynchronous you know what does um participation look like on uh, on that and we can have all of these great ideas about how we're going to participate but sometimes the tools are there um there's not that presence by by um by tutors so definitely we've had a bit of experimentation you can see in front of us that you know when we're in classroom um we are learning by participation. Yeah. We're pretty much used to, on your course, you're used to doing and reflecting and yeah. talking together, aren't you? So I think our challenge has been, how do you not do the same things online? Because like, mm -hmm. we can't, but how can we bring that sense of fun as well? The interpretation of others, I think, as well, we need to do that. Like, the idea of right and wrong, is it right and wrong? 
is the right and wrong? Is it a yes or no, or is it actually, yeah, this is open to interpretation? Yeah. And sometimes we need to have that modelled to us a little bit by, by tutors and for students to see that tutors are finding their way around and that tutors are curious as well. And we sort of, I know when I'm teaching, I'm trying to model that curiosity, model that excitement. So I'm in the learning process as well. And it's not a case of, well, what do you think? Because instantly, what, what am I allowed to do online? How does this work? Are the rules different? So that's generally our approach where we set out to want to experiment together to find ways, whether we were in the same space or online, whether it was together in real time or asynchronously, what can be playful, what can be experimental, what can explorative learning look like. And really quickly, we, I think, reflected that in the early days of being of, of lockdown and COVID, is that the online spaces were really flat. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. I don't know what your experience was. It just felt very one-dimensional. It was very dull to, yeah. Um, like, personally, in August, mm. yeah, it was more case of on lectures. There would be not really many activities. It was more talking, listening to a slide. And then every so often, it would be a case of just, have you got any questions? Yeah, and you could put them on like a whiteboard, I think it was called. Yeah. Um, but like Millie said before, it's a confidence thing. Nobody wanted to go first yeah. in case we got it wrong. So the activities didn't work and there wasn't any other resources for us to use. Yeah, so, so you have to go from this very it. passive yeah. sort of, I've been sitting here for so long watching this thing presented at me, to then suddenly, okay, over to you. And it was a big jump, wasn't it? Yeah. Just to add to that as well, we got put into, we call them breakout rooms, which are little groups of discussion about whatever topic you're talking about. Out of everything, that was the bit that didn't work. Yeah. Because, why is that thing? Because people would then say that they'd lost connection and there'd be one right. other person in the room and... Just the idea of, well, have you lost connection or do you just not want to do it? Yeah. Type situation. Yeah. So keeping that flow and the variety in the teaching situation yeah. was quite important and different types of interaction, different types of content and, yeah, and ensuring that people wanted to persist in their learning. I know one of my thoughts in those early days was, you know, you could lose people quite quickly. Um, I think there's a major part of it as well that this was our first year. None of us had met each other unless we were online. So we'd never actually met each other in person. So we didn't actually know huge, what yeah. they were like. So that knocks your confidence even more, maybe. Yeah. So re what does relationship building and what is that social, you know, um, interaction and the building of rapport look like online you know um and we i think very quickly came to think it has to be more than getting people to introduce themselves in the chat in a tool like blackboard collaborate for example um, i wonder if we could look at the next slide okay now this is a picture of my 21 year old who i think would cringe slightly um, but one of the things that we've experimented with quite a bit is to think about um, the tools that we use and to think about ways in which we can open up inquiry. I might sort of think that. So at a starting point, we sort of ramp up a little bit through the presentation, that we've started, we started to do a lot more with images. So. Um, you know, I suppose in response to what you're saying there, Grace, is, is that we want there to be easy ways in for participation and, and not this experience where you got to the end of a lecture and then suddenly you've got to step up in a big way. So providing, working with images and asking those open questions again, so you could literally go, you know, what do you see here? Um, questions like that, where we are actively saying, 
It's not about right or wrong answers. Um, and in training people within this university across different faculties and disciplines, I found that that's not just for, you know, uh, cultural studies or sociology or things like that. That can be done in relation to mathematics and chemistry and uh, architecture and all sorts of other subjects as well. So, I, but I don't know, that, that's the thought I had about using images. Did using images work for either of you? Yeah. You can be honest. <laughs> really good question. Like, um, I think with images, it's more of your interpretation rather than the right or wrong answer. Because in terms of the confidence that we're speaking about before, um, like if there is just the right answer, you'd be worried in case you get it wrong. Whereas with images, there is no right or wrong answer. It's more what you see and what you think. Um, Does that make it easier to then chip in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Millie, what about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I liked the idea, I know your lectures in particular, you specifically use the idea of visual learning, whether that's like these or whether it's the pictures, it's, mm. okay, well, how do you interpret this? But how do others interpret it? Is it the same? Is it different? Could they be linked together? but coming from two different viewpoints. Yeah. I think that's quite important. And then following that, it's not only like initial understanding, it's okay, well, I remember this lecture when I'm writing my assignment because uh, mm. Mm. then I can like visualize, oh, such and such said this about this particular picture. Maybe I could put that viewpoint in, but actually supporting from research. It's like putting all the sticky notes in yeah. your memory, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like reading a book with pictures, I suppose. It's the same idea yeah, as you've yeah. got the text that maybe says one thing, but then yeah. the picture says something different. So this was our starting point, and we, we you know, we played around online and in, uh, you know, synchronously and asynchronously with, with images. And if we can just move to the next slide, that would be great. Okay, um, so one of the things generally that we have been thinking about is the fact that when we're together, we use stuff, we use objects, we, uh, and, you know, certainly in my own work, I've been really interested in the power of scanning things, the power of touching things, the power of selecting things, the power of creating structures that you can see. And the thought behind that is that something then becomes a shared object of inquiry. So we're materializing learning. We're actually modeling something. And when we touch things and move things and select things, we can begin to narrate that process a little bit through. So something that's quite simple as saying, pick a card, actually, we can all pick a card, but then we can gently move into a process of saying, well, why that one or why why do you think these two things are, are most relevant um so again for you for you guys when you're handling things or when there are when there are objects or when there's materials how does that change learning for you if it does um i think well for me personally it's more you get to not only see in here but you get to do stuff as well at the same time which i find a lot more like stimulating and easier to learn from um, whereas if you sat there listening and looking at something, I just find it very difficult to like process and take in the information. Right. Um, and like doing stuff like the cards and stuff, and then you can show them around, you can like touch them and stuff, and it's just a lot easier. Yeah. It's like engaging, well some of the feedback we're getting is that it's about engaging as a whole person, and I suppose it contrasts with what you both were saying before about sitting there and being an audience yeah. it's sort of switching out of audience mode and seeing that we're constructing knowledge together we might not use phrases like that but so how do, how do objects work for you Millie is, is it different or I'd say it was very similar to Grace but in the same respect I think it's very important to have both Right. So a lot of, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, 
but a lot of lecturers will go, ah, oh, okay, so as an asynchronous task, you need to read this book or you need to read this chapter. Well, actually, the, how valuable is it to sit and read a book? However, I don't think it's... Mm, that goes back to some... Um, you're making me think of one of the comments that we shared before about actually having very clear purpose and meaning for activities, yeah. not just sticking them up there. I think it's important to have both. Yeah. So some will be, okay, read this chapter and then apply your learning to this particular object. Right. Or some will be, okay, so this week we're going to read a chapter, next week we're going to show interpretation and... And then you follow others. through, yeah. right, right, yeah. okay. I like the idea of both, basically. Can we have the next slide? So one of our, one of our starting points um, was um, using Tales Elevate, actually. Mm -hmm. And in, a, in some senses, it was a small change. But I think, well, I, I'll let you talk about it. But I think it it had a big impact yeah. for many people, not everyone, but for many people. Do you want to talk about your experiences, like what you did, how it was different, why it worked for you, if it did? Um, well, like with normal reading a book, you would just sit and read, whereas with Palace Elevate, you could see people's comments, see their interpretation of the readings and stuff, um, as well as coming back to them, so you're kind of mm. engaging in a discussion on points that you're reading about. Um, which is really helpful because you can come across things that you didn't think of um, and as well as that the lecturers can like jump in and Kill ask you questions and yeah it fills the argument a lot more. I um, made a point of trying to well not just trying but posting sort of prompt questions or demonstrating a bit of curiosity and I personally found that that kick-started that discussion a lot more was on the one or two occasions where I've not put those prompts in it there's been a you know the, the engagement has been slower to build completely agree with that to be fair <laughs> because as a student uh it is that like what we said with online who is going to do it first so if if the lecturer initiates that process it eases the pressure of us, yeah. but it's also, this is just general very quickly, but it's, as a student, you don't just have one reading to do or one sure. task to do, it's, you've got six different modules and you, they each have three readings to do, you've only got seven days a week, um, with this is just taking into academic, not taking into everything else you've got to fit in there, that's work mm. or social life or whatever. But the idea of the Talus Elevate is that you So it can, focused it a bit, doesn't it? It focuses it, but you can dip in and out, so you can read like a couple of paragraphs when you're on your way and then put in a few comments and then go back to it a couple of days later when you've got, I don't know, a study session and then put some more comments in and read what others mm. but there's no pressure I didn't feel for you personally to put a comment in you could literally read through sure. nobody's like waiting for a response yeah. whereas with others I think that's quite a major thing like I don't know you can speak about your experiences here Ian where mm. if you're on Blackboard Collaborate you ask a question, you're waiting for the <laughs> response by the other students, but nobody else is giving the response. So they... And sometimes it is when it's that you versus me thing in teaching yeah. and learning. I think what we experimented with and what Talis Elevate helps us to work with is this idea of we're sort of working parallel with each other and we are focusing on being curious and we're focusing on sort of switching perspectives so we can respond to one another. I wonder if I can have the next screen. Oh, we're doing rotate. Okay, timeline. 
So this is sort of where we are currently at. And uh, rather than to fill the screen with lots and lots of examples, because there are other ones, there's a couple here which just were really excited about. <laughs> and um, this is sort of one of the things that's come out of the question that we had about how can we be playful? How can we be in, engaged? How can we have different options of things to do? And, and in particular for me, it was that question of this just very one dimensional scrolling through content. And so one of the things that we did first of all in relation to, I think to the card stuff, we, we played with cards quite a bit. <clears throat> and you can see on the, the, um, the right hand side of the screen here where there's the, um, the various different cards with different titles in a space is that something that is quite simple, but um, we're, we're ready to sort of test it out with your group after Christmas, is um, having a, an interactive, this is sort of stage one, if you like, an interactive, clickable um, space, whereby, for example, in this one, uh, <clears throat> if somebody's thinking about research design, then we can be talking about, well, pick a card from each of the columns here. And when they click on that card, it spins over, you've got uh, your tutor talking through an audio track to, uh, at you on that, um, you've got a brief explanation, and then you go through a process of selecting things. So, yeah, any any thoughts on, do you think we've yeah. captured it as, as well as it was in the classroom? So, I think that the builder project of just the flip the card one ultimately there was a part of that in as far as I can remember in the first year and I thought that was really helpful um just to kind of it was more about like the foundations of what the degree had in store I right. suppose um the different things that you were going to be learning how that was going to be applicable to future life basically and then last year we used the builder project tool because we were doing our research proposals for a dissertation now i found it really helpful because it gave it, it didn't mean that you had to keep scrolling through the internet to find out <laughs> definitions of because all of these i don't know about anybody else but all of these definitions and all of these cards were completely new to me and I didn't know how to interpret the different aspects right. of it. So for the lecturer to then put it all together in one space was sure. beneficial. I'm, I'm thinking back to something we said earlier on about the right and wrong answers sort of thing. Yeah. And one of the things that we were trying to do with this tool is to provide, especially an asynchronous, playful environment where it was a bit of a sandbox and we could practice. So it's almost like the point here is not getting the right answer. It's like most people are going to do this a few times. Yeah. It was maybe also specifically for your lectures, I suppose, but this one, it was, okay, well, if you had this one to begin with, how does, which one links to the next column and then which one links to the next column, but again none of it was wrong yeah like and then we have... built in the, ref the review part which was about saying okay i've made these choices do they fit together and it wasn't about providing let's reveal the answers now it was about sort of enabling you to then go right okay this thing that i've constructed yeah. does it do the job um with the other one we can't do all the, the, the what we've begun to put together and we'll be using this next semester, I'm super excited about it, is this alongside the learning of the content, one of the things that you know we had feedback about through student reps and in the sessions was that too often tutors were saying, go away and work on this and come back in a couple of weeks. Now, for those students who felt low in confidence, going away and working on something was a mystery or somebody writing on an essay, this needs to be more critical was a mystery and actually was really unhelpful. Have you ever had feedback like that? Yeah. <laughs> so 
the, the sort of little village that you can see is one is part of the landing page of a tool where we talk, we're talking about uh, formative learning and practice learning. So there's an, it's built on a, a typology of formative learning that I've created where we're looking at comprehension, positionality, where relating elements within the text. Um, then there's the village with the houses joined together. That's be, beginning to string together an argument. Then the, the last one about steps, which is reviewing that. And whichever one you click in, we've got a really rich interactive tool, which is which involves dragging and pulling things, or you know various different activities. So it's it's this sense of that's that tool for you, and each of the houses, if you like, helps you to achieve a really specific thing. Whether it is, do I understand the words in the text and the terms? Whether it is, do I understand the perspective the author's coming from? Whether how do I apply it? Yeah, how do I apply it? What do I want to say in response? So it is very much that purposeful thing where we're not saying, well, this is an activity. So if we can have the next slide, I'll probably be we're probably pushing on to time, and this will be the final one. Um, I'm really happy to sort of share links to people um, in relation to literature on this, and we've had some previous great suggestions as well. But essentially, this is running alongside the, the sort of the scholarship around this area where we are asking questions about what are the affordances of whatever tools we use. And you know, whether that is what happens when we throw dice or what happens when we pick cards, but then also how does that translate into learning off campus? How does that translate into um, learning online and I know that I've had great conversations with the Talis team about saying you know in the future perhaps there's even more diverse ways for us to pick and choose and shape and model and uh, be playful in our learning so that we create the learning environment where, where people have permission all the things you've been talking about I guess we feel confident we can ask questions Having the variety in learning, isn't it? I think is, is the main kind of point to take away from this, whether it's like the group learning or online learning, because then it's, I guess it's understanding a perspective from both sides of the argument. So yeah. what you think is valuable, but then getting feedback from us, but then us showing to you what is valuable yeah. and whether it actually is valuable like if you asked to do a group project and then we did it but you didn't get the information that you were expecting us to give then don't keep trying that way out I suppose yeah. it's like and there's a challenge to keep yeah. to keep testing learning and, and to see it as a collaborative venture so it's not a challenge to my expertise to draw on your expertise yeah. so I mean that's that's us today we probably could talk for a lot longer because we feel really passionate about this but we are uh, super happy to take any questions <laughs>